Welcome to the Classical Happy Hour. I'm your host, Martin Davids. This is the show where my guests and I talk about music while enjoying a tasty beverage. Then we try to play some music together. Today's guest is Jerry Lou Zyke. Hi, Jerry Lou. Hi, Marty. Awesome to have you on the show. So tell me a little bit about like your first musical experiences. Like, How did you become a musician? Well, if I can first say I'm totally fangirling here because I've been... A fan of your podcast from day one and you know I love the ice cube sound I'm just obsessed with that but every time I listen to it I hear your voice and I think of you and all our memories together and then I hear my friends like John Rosendahl and David Schrader and Rachel and Heather and it's just been so incredible John Lenty like I was crying I miss these people and so I just want to thank you for bringing this podcast because to me, it's just opened up my world to my friends that I've made music with for so many years and then also people that I've heard of that I am learning about. And so it's just incredible and I just think you're incredible. And so I am so honored to be here and I love the ice cube sound. There we go. And so my first musical experience... I'm just going to say that I was raised in the inner city of Chicago, and we had five kids, two parents, in a very small apartment, so there was one upright piano. So all of the children had to learn to play piano when we were three, my mother taught us, and it was a matter of discipline and regiment. It really didn't have too much about love and heart. It was do your scales and do your arpeggios and right hand, left hand. So my experience is more of the discipline aspect. And I really didn't enjoy the piano because my sisters and brothers, they were all better than me because I was one of the youngest. So it took a long time for me to realize that I am a musician, but I'm just not loving the piano. So I turned to violin quite late in life. I think I was about 14 very scrappy, very uh, inner city, go to your neighborhood, try to find a violin teacher type of thing. Never knew I wanted to be a musician, but I just knew I just didn't want to play piano like everybody else. Wow. So you found a teacher in town, and did were your parents willing to pay for that? Or? Yeah, so the reason why we all played piano is because my mother taught us for free. So uh, someone moved in next door that was a violinist, and that was our neighbor, and we, I did some cleaning for them, and so I bartered my violin lessons for my, for my neighbor. So that's how I took that. And, um, so you were like 14, paying for your own lessons, basically? Correct, and that's just been my whole life. I'm super scrappy, and I just figure it out, and uh, um, that's just part of who I am. And... Uh, when I got to the point, I went to Lane Tech High School. They had an orchestra, and so I just did that because it, I had to choose a major, and so I picked music. There are majors in, in high yes, school? Yes, in high school, wow. right. And then, uh, so, and then I just kept at it and uh, got a scholarship, um, went to Wheaton College because my family is uh, very conservative and this was a private school that would keep me on my straight path and uh, then I kind of found the love of music and it was really all kinds of music and I kind of broke out of the straight church music uh, that I was taught and uh, so everything came later I always played catch up but I knew that I, I could do it. So you said everyone had to play the piano. So was it, was music a big part of your family? It was, but it was more church music, and it was more about serving people, and uh, it was not so much about becoming a musician, so much as what you could bring to other people and how you could aid the worship service and. So it was more of utility. So were people in your family like church organists? Or? Yes, all of the above. And choir directors. And okay, so they were actually employed 
making music in the church. Correct, correct. And then uh, that kind of switch out. But I was the only professional um, one. You know, they they became teachers. I shouldn't say that they're not professional, but they became teachers. But um, yeah, I just saw something different for my life. So. So you majored in music in high school and then yes. you stuck with it exactly. when you went to college. You're like, okay, yeah. I'm already here. Exactly. It was all about how can I make a living? And it was never about how much I loved it. It was about I'm going to put groups together and I'm going to teach and uh, and I'm going to be able to pay for this instrument and then I'm going to pay for my car. And it was always, there was always a back end of, uh, figuring out how life was going to be and not have to work at Walgreens or whatever. So I used music as a way to make a living, and I didn't come to realize how much I loved music un- until much later in life. So I taught 40 students, and I was in college, and I was getting my master's degree, and I was driving everywhere and teaching and uh, I knew that I had the energy and the love of people Um, but it wasn't until like I was 30 that I realized you know I'm done playing catch-up and and I I love what I'm doing cool so when you got out of music school what did you have a plan for what you, you were gonna do I mean you were you said that everything had to make you money basically or right. help you survive and pay right. off your instrument but did, was there a rethinking like I'm going to be in an orchestra or no n- there was never a, a desire to be in an orchestra because I wanted to be more successful as far as being an entrepreneur so I didn't want to just sit and have a boss and tell us what we had to play every day and so I loved providing work for musicians I loved working with all kinds of musicians and uh, I played everywhere uh, $50, $100, $150 and the more I would employ musicians the more I realized people need work and uh, I was able to find work and uh, I was a really good salesman and so I would talk you know churches and brides and everyone into hiring my groups and so and that has just never stopped it's just gotten grander and more refined and but uh, I loved the art of the deal and the sale and the whole process of putting something together I love this um (laughs) so none of that they teach you in music school right correct I literally learned that from my mother since I was three years old it was like you got to you got to figure it out and you, you've got to uh, you've got to know who you're around you've got to surround yourself with the right people and um, you have to figure out how much you're worth and so it worked and I'm, I'm still that same girl as I was I played my first gig when I was like seventh grade I put a trio together and I had I was teaching students in a woman's bathroom in my college because it wasn't allowed for us to teach and make money. And I mean, I just How figured big was it out. <laughs> it was pretty big, but I mean, I put a sign up on the door and it just said, um, don't come in or something like that. And I just taught my students. So I just figured out a way, but um, it has served me well. And I just love what I do. I love surrounding myself with great musicians and providing work and doing it well and uh, doing all kinds of music so all right bathroom violin teaching that's right plumbing emergency do not enter (laughs) exactly (laughs) exactly i think that's what the sign said did it really yes wow just pulled that out of the air Mm -hmm. um so are you doing any teaching these days no um i taught 30 years and as soon as I hit my 30 year mark we decided my husband and I decided we would move downtown and that is when I realized I wanted a piano and I wanted a full studio and I had that up where I lived in Evanston and Fort Sheridan and moving downtown it was too difficult to 
continue teaching and I knew that I wanted to perform even more. And so now I can walk to anywhere downtown with my violin and I had 30 years of grade students, many of which stay in touch with me, which is incredible. Many of them are incredible orchestras and doing wonderful things in music. So that's just been a delight. Um, but for now, I'm uh, doing mostly performing, but still contracting so much. Cool. So, I mean, I know you... you learn the art of the deal from your mom but like where did you learn contracting like from other contractors no uh actually i think i learned from other contractors how to not do things which is also a really good teaching method so uh i always knew i had a very detailed mind so it was not a problem for me to know all the details and ask all the hard questions and you know, make sure the check got there a month in advance instead of the day of the job, trying to chase someone down. And But the contracting, knowing who plays well together and who plays what music well and who who's willing to do the hard things and uh, the six-hour gigs or the recording that they'll be perfect on the spot. So um, I know that my mind can handle a lot of details and nothing really flusters me. And I know I have a strong will. I can barrel through things. And so this is just part of it. Like I, I know, you know, how to tell musicians to make them feel comfortable and safe. Where, where you know, what the pitch is and what the room is going to be like and what they have to bring and make sure they get the music on time and just making sure that they know they'll be paid well and cared for because I love musicians and I think... They're all geniuses, you being one of them. And I love seeing the genius in each person. Um, it's just extraordinary. And each day I'm so grateful to be doing what I do, to be surrounded by these incredible people that teach me every day. Cool. So let's uh, take a turn here. And uh, what do you think about fitness is that important and to somebody in, with a career in music oh well you've hit my sweet spot and uh when i was 40 i was playing in a lot of different orchestras and i would look around and i would see people who were getting older and i and i saw their bodies and how they were holding their instruments and how they were having to change their posture as they got older and just even how you sit in a chair with a violin and I thought I've got to like look into this because I have to continue to pay my bills all the way to death to us part so I started reading and I found that the endurance athlete is very similar to an endurance musician and that is I can play two sets of three hour concert or three hour rehearsals so that's six hour rehearsal and then I can go play a concert two and a half hour three hour con concert and the next morning I can do it again and so that's when I started reading and I started long distance running and I realized oh my goodness we musicians are athletes and no one is talking about this um we everything we do is the mind of an athlete the repetition the discipline and so I found the transition into being um an athlete was so easy and there was no performance anxiety you stand in front of a race and I see everyone's nervous and I'm wondering why am I not nervous like I'm new to this I'm 40 I'm 44 I'm 45 and it's because I've been performing in front of public since I was six and like no one's paying for these tickets <laughs> so uh yeah i love fitness i love being healthy i love having a strong core for my violin i love swimming so that i have no tightness in my neck you and i spoke about there's nothing good about a high shoulder like i see people walking around with high shoulders and i know how to help them and they come to me and ask 
me how I can help them but I don't speak to anyone about it until they come to me um, but that's just been a beautiful thing so now I love being a competitive athlete and yes I came to it very late but I'm finding myself that I'm just hitting my stride and I'm 60 and it's just delightful so I'm super active and I train every day and I race at least every third week um, doing triathlons and Ironmans and marathons and it just all works well so thank you for asking it's really something I don't talk about a lot so I mean I don't know any other iron women or <laughs> slash men so I th you know it's definitely an amazing accomplishment to be able to finish one of those let alone more than one or a marathon um so is there anything in particular like any type of exercise or type yeah that you feel like helps your playing specifically or your endurance as a player sure um it's really important to have strength and you only really get strength by doing uh, strength training and also flexibility by doing yoga and stretches and um, so at first it was really important to me to have a an entire body strength so legs and arms and shoulders and I just made sure that I did more repetition and not so heavy but the more um, the longer I did it the more I realized I could also do heavy but that was not the reason was not how do I look but the reason was how is my sound and all of a sudden my my sound on my violin sounded so good and it had nothing to do with practicing and then I noticed the more I swam and did long miles two miles three miles in the lake I f I felt that I could go from gig to gig and and hold my violin and hold 30 pounds of music and lights and stands and not have any issues whatsoever with posture and uh, so yeah I feel doing core push-ups uh, chin-ups all of that helps any musician and uh, I just totally love that you and Julia many people probably know that I'm a, like Dr. J is like one of my best friends and you set up your gym and that was really an exciting day for me to watch you guys do that because I knew that this was going to get you from your 30s to your 40s to your 50s and that's uh, I just want that for all my musician friends and many people are scared of it uh, they think that's going to hurt their hands or but it's the opposite. If you're not in motion and doing strength, you lose um, that. So I, anybody who wants to talk about it, I love talking about it. It's just, it's my heart. Yeah. No, I've never met anyone that said, uh, God, I wish I was weaker. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's not a thing. It's not a thing. Cool. Well, yeah. I course agree with all that you know and if you're sitting in a chair all day it's good to have a little strength in the core of your body absolutely you know I had like one of these blushing moments that just took me off guard but I was playing in an orchestra a smaller chamber orchestra and the conductor stopped I was playing concert master the conductor stopped and he said I want you all to look at Jerry Lou how she's sitting and I, I, I mean, I'm ne like, I'm never embarrassed or shy or whatever, but this was like a moment where it was just like, oh no, don't do this, don't do this. Um, but he said, she's sitting like she's standing and her core is holding her up. And this is how I want you all to be because she's fully engaged. And the only reason I bring that up is because it's exactly right it's just no one has ever pointed it out um, and I never want anyone to feel uh, ashamed of how they sit or whatever but you know if if we're in this for longevity this is something that we need to think about your fourth finger trills 
and how you sit and how you feel because it's all about the next day. Will you be able to play nine hours the next day? And then the next day, will you be able to do a recording session without fatiguing? So this is all about, it, all about um, not music, but it's all about your mental health and your physical health. Yeah, I think we also can't ignore diet, right? Oh, yeah. So, yeah. People have been asking me since I was 40, because that's when I started on this. Oh, come on, just have a bite of this. Have a bite of this. Um, But I just decided that the way I was going to be able to train and have my mind focused was going to be healthy food, and it was going to be food that was going to carry me on to the next gig, to the next gig. And as soon as I saw all these people stopping off for Chinatown and I I'd bring my own food and I'd have fun with them but sure enough the fir- after the first hour of the opera I watched them all going into like a coma and I was ready for the next two and I just thought you know this food thing is really important uh and uh so I'm super careful what I eat right before a concert you and I have spoke about that you know there's nothing wrong about it a good peanut butter and jelly sandwich, you know, uh, an hour before it's like the right protein, the right, you have to have the right salt, fat, sugar, and it's got to be the right combination so that your brain is as fit as your hands. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've tried some quack diet one time mm. and, uh, some kind of, a low carb I, or I something. I don't even want to tell you what it was, okay, but, yeah. uh, it, I, th- I think I was eating like nuts mm-hmm. and just protein and whatever it was. And I remember I had to play a concert mm. and I felt like a moron. Yeah. I was like, what is wrong? Like I need some freaking carbs here. Yep. Yeah. It's, it's really important. It's important what time of day you eat. And that's why this triathlon thing is, is a life thing. Like I, you got to go from one thing to another to another and musicians don't realize they are already triathletes they're just doing you know it with their instruments but uh when you eat and what you eat and uh i just happen to love to get up super early and work out and then i I have a breakfast and then i practice then i have another breakfast and then i train some more and and then i go to a rehearsal and then i eat again and yeah so it's just to me food is just fuel it I have no relationship with few, uh, food. It, uh, it's just, what is it going to carry me into the next thing? And uh, that's why I feel good all the time. And uh, so if anybody wants to talk to me about that, I'd love to help you on your road. But uh, that's just me, and I have no judgments to anyone else. Uh, I, don't, I don't suggest this for anybody, <laughs> but I just happen to have boundless energy, and uh, it works for me. And so that's why I love hanging with you, Marty, because you match my energy and you like you you bring me into your energy. And I love that. And I love playing with lots of sound and lots of juice. And it's just really exciting um, to work with you so much. Uh, It's probably one of the greatest highlights of my musical career. Just as a, like an FDA warning here, if you if you eat the same diet as Jerry Lee, you're not guaranteed to have the same energy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of that is probably uh, I've worked on that. So, but yeah, you're one of a kind. Okay, Thank so you. do you have any advice for young musicians? Oh wow, it's such a great question. I have ad- I I never really give advice, but I give this advice to myself every day, and that is you could never be overprepared. You just need to always be prepared because you don't know who you're sitting next to. You don't know who's listening. And being overprepared makes you courageous and confident, and that's what you need to be to be a great musician. You can't be insecure. You can't be in your head. And so uh, I'm always prepared and always have to remind myself every day, go be over prepared so that if there's a screaming baby in front of you and you're playing a solo, it doesn't distract you. Um, you know this. Or 
if you if someone is playing out of tune and just you hold your own and it's just by being super ready so I I say that to myself every day and I would say that to my young self um, but I always knew that I just knew that um, if you want to have confidence and you want to feel great about what you're about to do it doesn't matter if it's a Mother's Day brunch or a wedding or funeral or one of the most exposed parts in a recording it's the same mindset and that is that you know your your strength is because you are prepared because you put the work in a lot of people are naturally gifted I am not but I know that I can come right up with them those natural gifted people and then actually go above because I have the endurance and I have the mind to continue on well into the third and fourth hour so um, that's just something that I know about myself and uh, I don't speak about it a lot but you asked and so I'm being super vulnerable you definitely have tenacity thank you you too yeah you know you say talk about the people that are naturally talented and yes. sometimes I think when they're getting near retirement age they think they can do the same preparation they did when they were younger because they were so talented it was everything was so easy for them and it's a little sad when they just come up a little short absolutely and also uh, can we just talk about that like I used to be able to take out my violin and just play a concert and maybe I maybe I couldn't but I thought I could but now like warming up at home it's, it's essential getting to the job early getting to the concert early playing getting everything ready like we are dealing with muscles and connective tissue and nerves and it all needs to be lubricated and that's with motion and uh so as we age you have to do more of that and sometimes you got to warm down if you have a big concert it's really good to get home and just play 10 minutes 15 minutes of etudes to put it all back together but um that's that's part of the regiment because I'm in I'm in this uh, until I'm not and uh, so yeah but you know I love listening to those super gifted people play you are one of them just improvisation and freedom but I also know that you've put the work into it let's talk about Baroque and alone <laughs> I mean <laughs> that cd is so inspired and so incredible um so that juices me up and that inspires me all these artists around me inspire me for the hard things they do but we each have different things we do well so the beauty of putting the right people together is when it all comes together everyone's in like a flow motion so um yes i i do agree um but I, but I still will say that just being around artists who love what they do, their passion never changes. So that's really, to me, something that's a delight to be around those people. And I think that surrounding yourself with people who you want to be around that give you life, that teach you, is maybe one of the most important things I've learned in the last five years is that I want to be around people who give life to me and who teach me and that I just want to be a student of whether it's their thought process, whether it's books they've read, whether it's how they play a an ornament or whatever, that's the people I want to be around. Um, and so that's just been... To me, that's why I love being a professional musician is because we have the most stunning people around and all of these people do other things well, too. You know, they they look for birds and <laughs> they have all photography and they do all these other amazing things. I mean, 
your wife is one of them. She's got so many fires going and it's just so exciting to watch her and it's inspiring and she does everything well and so um that was probably a tangent but I just had to get that out (laughs) well I definitely admire how you still love it so much and just are always interested in the music and what's and speaking of music uh anything cool coming up Oh, I always have really cool stuff. Um, I have a string quartet that we do all kinds of concerts with different music. So right now we're doing music of the bands of the 60s, 70s, and 80s. So who doesn't love playing like the bands Chicago or the Beatles or Kansas or Guns N' Roses? I just love doing that alternative uh, and making great arrangements. Um, I'm also doing an all late Beethoven concert which is you know it was like one of my most favorite COVID projects is just learning all the Beethoven string quartets and we have Haymarket coming up which is going to be great we're doing a great recording of uh, Le Mont uh, by Joseph um, Ballon and that's going to be in June and there's nothing more exciting for me than I do all the press, um, making sure they're all there, and I and I work on the board, and I love working for this opera company that is so inspiring, and I've worked from the very beginning, and it's really part of my heart, is to promote the early music staging as it was. I mean, if our m- instruments are 18th century instruments, and I have such gorgeous instruments, the stage should also appear like that. So I love watching the costumes be exactly the way they were. And I mean, do you remember that beautiful concert we did a couple of years ago, the Marais, uh, the Marin Marais concert of uh, Ariane at Bacchus, where we played music no one had ever played except for when it was performed 300 years ago because there were no parts. And this amazing lute player found it the score and I mean Haymarket has just done so many amazing things and we sold out three concert halls and people from all over the world came to hear and we had lutes and vials and bass violins and it was just the colors and I remember watching and working with you it was really we were producing some of the most beautiful music like who doesn't love French Baroque music true (laughs) <laughs> but my favorite has to be the dragon of Wantley. Oh, yes, the dragon. <laughs> Absolutely. But you know what? If we're going to talk about favorites, and I know this is simple, but when we recorded during the COVID years, um, when we were doing Haymarket recording and making our movies, you and I did Asus um, handle, and we there was no editing and we just it was just you and I with a small orchestra but no other violins and I couldn't believe that we were going to have just two violins playing early period instruments and we were going to record it and not have any editing and so I was sitting on the couch waiting for our movie to come up and thinking this is really going to be like how can two people it's gonna be painful it's gonna be painful (laughs) this is just gonna be like and I remember listening and I I just I couldn't get enough of it and I realized because you and I have played together for so long it was so in tune you couldn't hear that there were two players and we had no editing and we nailed it I mean I'm all about accuracy but we had to be hyper vigilant with our accuracy and plus we were like 20 feet away with masks on with masks on (laughs) and it was like crazy it was hot and i just i don't know that's these are things that i i realize it's the process it's never about the actual concert or the finish line it's never about the big medal or whatever like i give all my medals away it's always about the process and to me that's about people and for us to do that was, yeah, I, I won't forget that there's, and 
there's that's why I love your podcast because I listen to these people who, with whom I've made music and I love them and I'm not even sure they know I love them but even like Nicholas the conductor like he doesn't even know like maybe that I was playing that I played underneath him but just hearing him talk it's uh I I am just in awe of you starting this podcast and I just love it and uh, I hope you continue it I will always be your number one fan <laughs> and it's such a delight and uh I sit and I listen, I'll be in my car and I'll start weeping or I'm sitting on my bike train or I'm start, I'll have to stop. <laughs> but it's, that's how much I love these people. Well, thanks, Jared. Yeah. Um, so to finish up here before we go take a break and play, uh, is there anything you want to ask me? <gasps> yes, absolutely. Marty Davids, when you go out on the road... And you're playing with all these different orchestras. Do you love being away from Chicago? Or do you feel like I should stay home and work more in Chicago? Like, I want to understand what actually happens when you you go on the road. Because you have a completely different life than I do. You go and play a week here, a week there. And you're traveling and... I want to understand the hotel life and the planes, and I I I want to understand: is it great music making, and is that why you're doing that? You know, part of it is the musical experiences. It's it's always refreshing to to work with different people, and a lot of them are really good. But a big part of it is the people, actually. Yes. And not even the music at all. That makes sense. So some of my best friends are on these gigs, and that's the only place I see a lot of these people. Yeah. So, like, they don't come here, and I don't go to their house, wherever it is, you know. We only meet on these concerts, and for a week, you know, an intense week of of music making. And I just love to see my friends, you know. That's great. You know... When this whole COVID thing happened and no one could touch and no one could be near each other, you were the first person I thought of. I thought, what is Marty Davids going to do when he can't hug everyone in the room? And we were not allowed to touch or whatever, but I feel like maybe you were one of the first people I hugged besides like my husband is because people mean so much to you and I feel the same way. But, uh, I love knowing that, that you're going and having a great time. I will say that you've been a great balance for me because I'm like a super serious, focused person. And a lot of people t- like get the wrong idea about what I am because I am focused and I want, I want everything to be perfect. Um, but you always bring the chill. You always bring the fun. And uh, I need that in my life. And and that's why I love having you in all the groups I play in because it's just a real good counterbalance for what what I'm bringing because I'm bringing a lot. But uh, you help balance me, and, and that's just been great. But, yeah, we miss you when you're gone, but it's uh, I'm so delighted to know that that's, you know, that's part of your love. And I, lo- I love that you do that because I take off too on huh? I'm racing everywhere. I'm racing California and Texas and Florida. And um, I think it's really healthy to jump a plane, do what you love, and come back. Definitely, yeah. Explore who you are in different places, too. Yes. And with different people. Um, Okay. Well, it's been awesome talking to you. Mm -hmm. Now let's try to to play a little music. We're going to take a break. Um, Thanks for listening. If you haven't purchase my new CD Baroque and Alone yet please order a copy um, actually I ran out today but I'm going to order some more so keep buying them I'll, uh, I'll send them as soon as I get them alright we'll be right back